Time Magazine called them lazy, selfish, entitled narcissists who live with their parents. Others have called them job hoppers and tech junkies with no sense of privacy. That's right, we're talking about millennials. And a few young adults from that generation are here to discuss those stereotypes and give you their opinion. This is the O oh Millennial Edition. I would say that they are voicing their concerns because they don't feel like they're being heard. If we want to have positive communities, we have to have positive businesses within them. And social media has democratized communication. Everyone's <laughs> like, no, like you're like almost 25, like you should be getting married. Absolutely not. I mean, that can be someone's goal, but that doesn't have to be all of our goals. What do you think that millennials can do? What can they borrow from Generation X or even the baby boom generation for that matter? Hello, I'm Ebony McMorris, and welcome to the O oh, the Millennial Edition. After the baby boomers in Generation X came those tech-driven, self-centered, and nonchalant millennials, or so they've been called. Born between the 80s and early 2000s, millennials have been branded as the me, me, me generation that has no sense of hard work or independence. True, false, or something in between. Let's meet our panel. I have Tim Pulliam, Public Relations Specialist with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, Brian Williams, Founder and CEO of PurchaseBlack.com, and Britt Waters, Associate Producer for Russ Parr Morning Show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um. So good to be here. <laughs> well, I'm glad you could join us today. Studies show that millennials are the most educated generation in history in terms of those holding at least a bachelor's degree but despite education some college grads are having a tough time finding employment what sort of factors play into the expectations and reality of finding a job after college tim i'm going to start with you on that one what are your thoughts i would say that the job pool is so small and shrinking um, there's a, a high demand on science technology and engineering and mathematics uh, fields and a lot of us are not going into those fields and that is an issue so you have all of this growth and stem related you know paths but we're just not in that that space so one thing that the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation is trying to do is build black leaders in that space we're trying to give out scholarships and fellowships for people that may be interested in going into that now Brian I'm gonna switch to you because you started your own business yes so what made you go that pathway? Well, there's a, there are a few factors. Uh, one being that as a millennial, I don't want to just work. I want to work a certain way. Um, we're very centric towards making sure that our work means something and does something that is personally important to us. And it's the difference between being employed and having a career to a millennial. Um, in, in my space, I want to do something that has a positive impact on the African American community. So I started a business that has that impact. So that was a part of the motivation for why I took the, the reins into my own hands. Now, Brittany, let me ask you, do you take, uh, are, are you offended at all when people call you a millennial and then they throw out words like lazy, narcissistic? No, not at all. I mean, when people call you selfish, it's not always a bad thing at this age. I'm under 25. I don't have children. I'm not married. I feel like me putting my goals first is what I should be doing. So if you call me selfish, I'm like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you made that point because I was reading, um, that when you look at what's a priority to millennials compared to what we were seeing in years past, I think a poll said um, in 1960, the order of things that you saw was to go to school, um, to leave home, um, have your own, create your own pathway, marriage, and then kids. And then when that poll was taken at that time, 77% of women had done that before the age of 30. Wow. And a recent poll said in 2010, when you take that same lineup, yeah. while they still had some of the same goals, it was like 10% of, the, of, of that age group had, had done that. So yeah. is it just that you have a different set of goals? What do you think? Or you're just Ooh. rerouting it? I would say rerouting. Um, rerouting. I think a lot of us are you know, ambitious. We're very protective of our brand and making sure that we establish who we are first. So you're using millennial words, brand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, brand. It's, it's, it's the truth. Right, is that, that That's real. all about that, that me, me, me? I, well, and, th and that sounds so bad, but it's the but truth. It? It's, I don't really think it's that bad. I think employers are looking to hire millennials um, who know who they are, who know their skill set, who are not fumbling around trying to figure out who they are. 
like I said, going back to your first point, there's so many, there's so few jobs out there that you have to brand yourself a certain way to get that job. And I want to add to that. What you talked about that 10% versus back in the days, it was a higher percentage. I think that as millennials, we prioritize living more of our lives. Uh, sooner. We value our youth. We value uh, travel and experiences and doing things that kind of contribute to our well-roundedness. And we want to do it before we get established with the house and the spouse and the children and those things that I don't want to say limit us, but increase the responsibility that we have outside of ourselves. So we want to enrich our lives as early as possible. And given the expense of our times, it's harder. So we have to really dedicate ourselves, like she said, really mm -hmm. dedicate ourselves mm -hmm. to being focused. To ourselves. Indeed. Everyone always says, oh, you guys don't know how to work your way up. You know, you're supposed to be this for like a certain amount of years before you get to live your goals. But now we're living in a world where a lot of us already have a bachelor's degree. So now it's like, oh, if you don't have a master's, like you have to keep exactly. keep going. Yeah. I don't so feel that way. But as a woman, do you feel um, pressure? Because you know, sometimes old school will come in and say, "You don't want kids. You don't want a husband." <laughs> you know, and then people will throw out numbers of, especially for minority women. You know. Uh, how hard it is to find a man these days. Do you feel that pressure? Oh, definitely, especially as a black woman. People are always like, oh, especially because I work in entertainment. But I was like, who are you dating? And I always say, I'm too young for boys. And I feel like I am. Like, everyone's <laughs> like, no, like, you're like almost 25. Like, you should be getting married. Absolutely not. I mean, that can be someone's goal, but that doesn't have to be all of our goals. And of course, I want to be married one day, maybe to Usher. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like right now, I need to focus on moving up. Do you feel guilty when you get those questions like, mm, you know, maybe I'm not where, you know, people think I should be and like do you ever ever, ever have that feeling like Do you feel guilty that you're not married? Good question. You know what? We got to take a break. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was really getting good cuz I felt a little tension going on. Sorry. <laughs> but up next we'll we'll stay on this a little bit and also to talk about millennials and technology. Are they obsessed or simply adjusting to the times? And privacy. How much of your personal life do you post online? We'll be right back, but of course, first, let me just take a selfie. Come on, y'all. Let's take a selfie. All right. Okay. All right. Cheese. <laughs> Welcome back to the O. Technology has made almost everything easier from getting around town with Uber, love Uber, mm -hmm. to connecting with friends around the globe. Staying connected is right at your fingertips, but some have said millennials are obsessed with this technology and it's made them lazy. What do you say? Are millennials tech crazy? And if so, is it a bad thing? I don't think it's tech crazy, I think it makes us more... You were ready more, for that. I, I didn't guess. even say I'm, I'm, <laughs> Ready to jump in. But I think it makes us more efficient, you know? I, I, I rely on my smartphone for my calendar, you know, to remind me about appointments, you know, Uber, of course, you know, there's this software that can kind of prior prioritize your day, you know? So I just, I rely on it for efficiency. Well, here's what I also want to talk about, because when we talk about communication and how effective it is, right? So things are quicker, it's easier, but this is sometimes annoying when you're talking to somebody and they're like, this the whole time. So you've heard about people even going out, having meetings or, or dating, and they're constantly on their phone or they're using it. And we have watches now, yeah. smart watches. So does it also break down some of the communication that we have? Is there, does it create a distance? And some statistics have said that. So you're, you know, you've got more information at your fingertips, yeah, but there's no relation going. Brian, okay. I'll ask you. Short answer, yes. Um, here's why. There's this concept called um, FOMO fear of missing out. When you are hyper-connected to uh, streams of, basically streams of consciousness online, timelines that are constantly updating with all of the information from all the people you actually want to hear from, um, whenever there's time passing and you don't know what's happening, there's this sense that you're missing out on something. The reality is you're not. The same things are going on now that were going on before we had Facebook and Twitter and all of these different things. It's just now we can see it constantly. So when we're supposed to be having personal interactions, sometimes we can feel as if we're not engaged in other things that but we like to be engaged in. But that's the obsession. Because it's so bad now that they have like, what, getaway camps that people can go to? 
um, and then you have to leave all of your technology at home and take a break. Mm -hmm. Some people cannot live without technology. And being in the media, Brittany, I'm sure, I mean, you tweet <laughs> all the time. I do. I'm a Twitter person, Instagram person, I'm always on it. But what you say with fear of missing out, people don't realize you're not really missing anything because what you see on Instagram isn't always what's really happening. I mean, I can, I can judge that. I can see people like, oh, look at her on Instagram doing this, and she's really not. Hmm. But that's but good that you brought that up because there was just a new, um, some number, look, I know, love numbers. <laughs> there was just a study that came out that said people who stay on Facebook constantly tend to be more depressed. And it, mm -hmm. and it could be mm -hmm. people are living false realities, right? So the how many people do you know post and you're like, yeah. that is not what really happened. Like yeah. when you post like girls on Mondays for Instagram, you post your man crush Monday. Like I would pick a nice like Usher looking guy, but that doesn't mean that the guy that I would actually <laughs> date is going to look like Usher. And just how, not to judge men, but they can be <laughs> obsessed over these girls on Instagram who have unrealistic bodies. They're photoshopped all the way. So then when regular people look at Instagram, they're like, is that what I'm supposed to look like? Politically, you can really talk about that as well, because I'm sure in that arena, um, the obsession for news, news you, you've been in, in news before, we're obsessed to get it first, and yes. we end up being wrong. How many times have we seen that happen? And you have to retract statements, and it could cost you your job, but I would say that as far as you know, social media, I do feel like I'm missing out if I'm not up on what's going on, especially as a, a, a journalist. You know, somebody would come up to me and say, hey, did you hear what happened here? And President like, Obama oh, no. just got his own personal oh, right. Twitter account. And I'm like, right. oh, I didn't know that. Oh, let me get on Twitter. So it is, I do feel a little, a little bit like I miss out yeah. a, a little bit. So, mm. yeah. But, but you feel like if you don't tweet or Instagram it, it didn't really happen. If I feel like it didn't. If you're doing something and you don't mm -hmm. post a picture, you don't tweet about it, did it happen? Because no one knows. Why does everybody have to know? And I think that's, so I think when you look at, at, at different generations, right? Mm -hmm. So my mother, you know, who may look at whether what I'm tweeting or my nephew, and she's like, why does everybody have to know what you're eating? Why is that important? Why is that necessary? Why can't we use it um, to do something else? So what does that say about mm -hmm. our, our, our culture? It, it is, it's indicating a couple things. One being, well, two things. We have to stratify the age groups when it comes to social media. Because when you look at the even younger generation than us, the high schoolers, they're not going to Facebook. Right, they're like on they're Instagram, going to Instagram, Snapchat, Snapchat mm -hmm. because they don't want their entire life to be cataloged on social media. Whereas, oh, that's why? Exactly. I thought Facebook was just old. It is. That's their parents are showing up on Facebook. You say it's old, but it's actually still the number one. Still absolutely. Um, among, I mean, among millennials, yeah. So yeah, this, this sense of having everything to the public isn't for all of the younger people, because there are a group of young people who do not want everything that they have uh, done cataloged on social media. But it's also competition. Like, why would you take a picture of your lunch? Besides to say, hey followers, my lunch is better than your lunch. You're not gonna take a picture of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but you're gonna take a picture of your dinner at Ruth's Chris. I think there's also something that's kind of engulfed our whole society because Absolutely. we see politicians a culture, who though. have um, tweeted out a picture, and then they take it back, mm -hmm. or name their names, mm -hmm. <laughs> of certain body parts, mm -hmm. and then they take it back and they say they didn't do it. So it's almost like- and They say I was hacked. They say yes. I was hacked. But we, we've also seen it used great in business for gimmicks to attract customers. So there's Absolutely. almost like a plus and a minus to it. It's almost like when, where do you draw the line? Well, just to speak to that point, let's say that you are going out to a restaurant, you don't have a good meal, they have a Twitter handle, you bash them, they'll give you a discount. So it, it works to your benefit to I've kind of that. tweet that stuff out I you've done that. in order to get what you want. You know what I mean? I'm shocked. I, I, what I, what I like that. about it is that, what I like about it is, it kind of takes the middleman out of certain things. So instead of having to go on, send a complaint and do all this exactly. stuff, you can do it right where you are. This is not good. Take a picture. Mm -hmm. And on that note, <laughs> I'm not encouraging anybody to do that. Speaking of social media, millennials have used technology to voice their support for political change. I love this. And social justice. In what ways have views changed or stayed the same from Generation X to millennials? Stay tuned. You don't want to miss this. Welcome back to the O 
According to a study done by the Pew Research Center, the millennial generation is the most ethnically diverse generation in American society. Studies show as generations feelings towards social and political issues have changed as well. But in what way? So to start, the Black Lives Matter movement has become a huge civil and social rights movement in recent times. And I really want to talk to that. I, look, I keep saying I'm going to go to you Sorry. first because you are with Congressional Black Caucus. Right. Now, you know, we've foundation. got foundation, foundation. So look, Baltimore, Ferguson, Absolutely. Staten Island. South what, Carolina and Charleston. South Carolina and Charleston. How are, is social media being used by um, the millennials versus Generation X? I would say that they are voicing their concerns because they don't feel like they're being heard, you know, to the general public. So that's a platform where they can use social media to snap a picture of someone being brutalized or being, you know, being a victim of ex excessive police force. So that's their platform. But what I'm so excited about with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation in September for our annual legislative conference, we're going to be talking about all of those issues mm -hmm. for millennials, giving them a platform to talk about those issues. Now, Brian, you know, with PurchaseBlack.com, you know, I've had several discussions about you about this changing movement. Mm -hmm. And even through your business, um, you try to educate those who you're connected with about how we can create social justice through through social media. Absolutely. There, there are several factors that come together, but no matter what happens, if you want true social justice, you have to have economic power. Right. You have to have your money in order. Even in Martin order Luther King said that. To sustain it. It's unsustainable with just ideas and fraud and, um, and feelings. So with Purchase Black, the goal is to siphon the money we already spend into businesses that help us in ways that matter to us. Our businesses contribute in significant ways to our communities. So if we want to have positive communities, we have to have positive businesses within them. And social media has democratized communication. So now a small business can reach a million people for free. That has never existed before. So it, it helps with, the, uh, with making the movement sustainable over time. Brittany, how did, were you able to use it when we had recently the issue in Baltimore with Freddie Gray on air? I mean, I know Radio One covered it wall to wall. Yeah. You were very instrumental in getting information out and responding to listeners. You have to be careful what you post. There are things that help when you're saying, here's what, where we are, here's what we're doing. Because people want to say, how can we help? And I know some things that I tweeted is, hey, if you want to help, we're giving out lunches here. We're cleaning up the streets here. But they can also get unhelpful, I would say. Someone can post a Facebook post of an article, you know, in support of something, and it'll get such and such amount of likes, but a lot of people aren't reading it. They're just saying, I want to do change, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to share this post instead of hitting the streets. And mm -hmm. that's where it can be like, you know, not really helpful. Well, no so real movement well, in and, and that's the like, I did my part. I posted this. I see. And so that's I don't where have to go outside in the streets now. Yeah. We saw that with the situation with the Nigerian girls, bring our girls back. But the question is, so with Generation X, we talk about creating movement and then the millennials. A big complaint is that you do all that, but there's no change. And so when you look at someone um, who is of Generation X, was it, did you feel like it was more, it's more grassroots or there was more purpose and plan to it? It wasn't just about, uh, or, or the tactics were different? I feel like, and I'm just, I feel like we lack a leader, a defined leader for our generation, the millennial it, generation. Absolutely. That can kind of move us to what we need to do and mm. move us to action. But the picture has changed, right? So we're go talking about the civil rights movement, and then now we're talking about the Generation Act, two generations after that, two groups af right after that. So in some ways, you have the millennials trying to gather the wisdom mm -hmm. of those during the civil rights movement um, while they're ahead technology-wise and disseminating and putting actions into plan, when it comes to some of that wisdom, it's almost like you, you borrow from, from years past. And so what do you think that millennials can do? What can they borrow from mm -hmm. Generation X, or even the baby boom generation for that matter, in terms of moving social justice forward? Because some of the issues are even different. When we Absolutely. talk about economic equality, we've always been fighting for that, but that's like the biggest thing on our table right now. Can I just disagree for a second? Because I don't want to sit on my Absolutely. hands. Absolutely. No, no, no. When no, you no. say we don't have any leaders, I think we have established leaders. Okay. Like I think who? there's who general people that millennials idolize. Name but five. it's the problem who they are. I think we've made it very clear that we look at Beyonce like she's bigger than some of the people that some would say could actually make change. But Kim Kardashian can post something and it can reach so many people. We have leaders. 
Do you even need? Do, are we moving it's into an age that we don't? Maybe. Well, you know who your who your leaders are, not more so than you know who they are. Maybe, or do you even need? leaders like we saw up front is that part of the change so you are the change that you want to be in your own communities absolutely now getting back to the congressional black caucus foundation that is our mantra you know you are the change it starts with you but i do believe that there is some benefit of a leader someone that you look up to that you can inspire to that can kind of guide the the, 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 the sheep you know what right. I mean? Create this, the tactics, the strategy, and the plan, and everybody fall in line. And I don't see Beyonce or Kim Kardashian in that role. You don't think Beyonce is because some be of the that movements role. that she's started or causes that she's kind of helped contribute to? Maybe it's just different when we define what a leader is. In I this think day people and age. are following her. She has a beehive. You say anything bad oh, yeah, about Beyonce, absolutely. people feel threatened. Yeah. I'm not saying Beyonce and Kim should be our leaders, but I'm saying it seems like we've elected them. I think that th when you look at a person like a Beyonce, and you look at a person like a Philip Agnew from, uh, I think, exactly. Dream Defenders, what he's doing, I think, is more along the lines of what you're referring to as a leader. Right. But Very what grassroots. she's referring to right. as a person that can mobilize. If, if mm -hmm. Beyonce says to do something, there is a contingent of people that will do it. And that is what a leader we're gonna do. And we've seen those two cultures come together. So you have pop culture and then you have those who are doing grassroots. And that combination is powerful. And we saw that True. even with the Black Power Movement. But we gotta go to break so <laughs> Actually, no, we're ending. Oh my God. I know, this was wonderful. Enjoyed That's it. all the time we have for this edition of The O. I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today. I'm Ebony McMorris. Catch you next time on The O.